Blog Talk Radio. Jamaica. We're here in Atlanta, Georgia. That's Janet Taylor, Evangelist Janet Taylor. I got joy. We have Evangelist Taylor Part 2 of the idols coming down. We give you now Evangelist Janet Taylor for one hour and 56 minutes undisturbed. You have the mic, Sister Taylor, and I'm going to sit back and let you feed me. All right. Well, praise the Lord, saints. We just want to thank God for everybody being here with us tonight, tuning in, those of you that are with us in the room. We thank God for you and you and you and you. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We are dealing with part two of the idols are coming down. Now, on last week, I uh, ministered to you out of 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, how when the Philistines had captured the ark of God and put it in their uh temple in the temple of Dagon, which was their false god, uh, God had to show who was the true and living God by uh, allowing Dagon to be toppled over twice, and they came back in there and stood him back up, and then uh, the second time his head broke off, his hands broke off, because God was showing that there is no God, no God in all the world that is equal to the true and living God. And tonight, uh, we're coming from the book of, first of all, we're going to come from uh, Exodus. Let's look at Exodus. Exodus chapter 20, verses uh, 1 through 5. And this is what it says. And God spake all these words 
saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto them uh, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Glory be to God. So God, uh, when he gave the Ten Commandments, he established that we should not, those who are his followers, should not serve other gods and bow down to them or even make any graven images of them. And he, he warned them what he would do if, uh, if they did this. And um, what, what was so um, amazing about this is that not only did God forbid them to do this, he also warned them. But the children of Israel, as soon as they came out of Egypt, the first thing that they did was make a, a, an idol. They made uh, this golden calf, and they began to worship it. While Moses was up in the mountain uh, with God, uh, when he came down, they had made a golden calf, and they were dancing around it and worshiping it, saying this was God who had brought them through the Red Sea. So the very thing that God told them not to do, they did it. And God was not pleased, and it brought judgment upon them. Um, so we know that we as believers are forbidden to serve idols. Glory be to God. And it, it, it just amazes me that in this day and time, we still have idols. So I want to look at uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, which says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image of any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the, he under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, we know that in uh, the book of Matthew, this is what Jesus commanded. He said that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So there's no room for error here. There's no room to say, oh, we did not know. There's no room to serve an idol. There's just no room because not only did God forbid it in the Old Testament, but Jesus came and said the same thing. Glory be to God. So uh, the Bible condemns idolatry, but idolatry looks different today than it did 2,000 years ago. Uh, today, we hear about the modern versions of idols, and um, when we hear about them, this is what always uh, comes to my mind anyway. Money, power, sex, control, approval from others, and, and, and the like. And the idea is that we are misusing those things and elevating them to be high when they are, are not. Now, let's talk about what is an idol. I'm going to give you uh, four definitions of what an idol is, and then I'm going to give you the Janet Taylor uh, version of what an idol is. So number one, an idol is something that we look to for things that only God can give. So people look to idols for help or for power or for uh, relief of some type. 
people or, or for a blessing, but only God can give those things. Number two, idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart, if I have that, then I'll feel that my life has meaning and I'll know I have value. So people look to idols for approval or to make themselves feel significant and secure. So uh, uh, anything that you're looking to for security other than God, so that would include things like jobs and careers and positions and titles. People think if if I get that, oh, I'm going to be okay. But that is also not true. Idols never satisfy. They never satisfy. Uh, If they did, people, uh, people wouldn't have much use for them. What happens is, is once you get that idol, then uh, after a little bit of time, and I mean a short amount of time, then you've got to move on and get the next idol because they don't satisfy. Now, number three, if anything becomes more uh, fundamental to you than God, to, like to your happiness or your meaning in life or even your identity, then that is an idol. So people uh, use idols to uh, make themselves feel like, uh, you know, that's their identity or or, or that's their happiness, like a car or a house, owning a home or or having, again, a certain position in life. Those all become idols. And the enemy will always tell you that, uh, uh, this is going to bring meaning to your life. But that, again, is a lot. Now, number four, an idol is anything that is more important to you than God, and it absorbs your heart and your attention more than God. So that could be things like television, sports, um, uh, 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 an organization that you're a part of. A lot of people are in uh, fraternities and sororities and Freemasonry and clubs of such. You know, those are idols because you feel like if you get in that, that's going to make you somebody, but it will not. Now, here's the Jan Taylor version of what an idol is. An idol is anything that you put before God. I don't care what you are doing. It could be your wife. It could be your husband. It can be your children. It can be your ministry. Because sometimes people make, uh, they make idols out of their ministry. It can be your church, your pastor. It can be a, a relationship that you're in. It can be anything that you put before God. That is an idol. And uh, very few people understand this today, and this is why people are worshiping idols. Now, when we look at the sports in America, sports in America has become an idol. Now, Jesus said that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might, mind. That's in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38. And what that means is exactly Exodus 20 and 3 says, Thou shall have no other gods before me. Now, the Lord did not want his people to give their hearts to anything ahead of him. That includes wealth, friends, uh, 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 marriage partners, anything that could distract us from serving him. So he warned his children in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and I'm going to read it for you, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. This always stuck with me from the moment I read it. God calls for separation. And he said uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, and he named all these nations, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, Canaanites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations 
that are greater and mightier than thou. He said, when the Lord thy God shall deliver thee from them, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. See, a covenant is, is, is a marriage. And uh, he said, don't make no covenant with them, nor show any mercy unto them. And then he went on to say, neither shalt thou make um, marriages with them. Thy son, don't give your, uh, your son his daughter, and don't give his, your daughter his son. And then he explained why. Now, God never has to explain to us why he said a thing, but he did in this particular instance. He said, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against them and destroy them suddenly. So God warned the children of Israel not to get involved with these other nations because they were a, 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 a heathen nation and they practiced all forms of idolatry. And for that reason, God dispossessed them, moved them out of their spaces, out of their homelands, and gave that land to Israel. So God said, don't mix with these people. Don't mess with them. Don't mix with them. He said, go in and utterly destroy them. And we know that the children of Israel did not do that. But it amazes me today how we see Christians trying to mix and mingle with all sorts of people of different um, ethnicities and different um, uh, uh, religious beliefs thinking that we can coexist. We cannot because we don't have common ground. You see, believers, we, those who believe in Jesus Christ, we have, it doesn't matter what country you live in, if you are a believer in Christ, Jesus Christ is our common denominator. That's what brings us together. But when you start mixing with uh, uh, people of other religions, we don't have common ground. We have absolutely nothing in common. And the scripture tells us that in um, 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read that for you because I want to make this clear tonight. This is what Jesus said. He said, uh, this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, there's no point in you trying to hook up with them, not in marriages, not in any type of covenant, not in business. You cannot, you won't find any common ground. You don't believe the same thing, so you can't mix and mingle with that. So he said, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. So what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? And what concord, and the word concord means fellowship or agreement, have Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then Paul concluded the matter by saying, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So we were commanded, hallelujah, by God, through the Apostle Paul, not to even try to mix or mingle with these people of other religions, because we don't have any fellowship with them. There's no agreement with them. He said that they would distract us from focusing on him. The Lord wants his people's thoughts, desires, and actions to be guided by him and not be enticed or seduced and led away 
by people of other uh, uh, religious beliefs. Because here's the bottom line. Either you're going to influence them or they are going to influence you. So uh, what we have today is these false gods, and uh, we have these false gods that are idols. Now, Paul said an idol is nothing, but I'm telling you something. To get involved in idolatry, which is the worship of idols, uh, that's a serious offense with God. So let's look at what are some of the examples of idols. Uh, One such example can be cultural and family tradition. You know, some people say, well, my family, we've always done this. That doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means that's something y'all have always done. And it could be uh, something that's very offensive. Uh, Political correctness. Uh, so many people are just hooked on politics, politics, politics. And um, while politics is, is, is in and of itself not an evil thing, but it has believers. Believers should not be caught up in political correctness, career aspirations. So many people, uh, they will cut your throat just to climb the ladder of, of, of what they call the ladder of success. And um, They don't mind doing whatever it takes to get to the top. But when you get there, will you have fulfilled the calling and purpose for your life, or will you have just satisfied your own selfish ambition? You see, the word self is is, is self-love. Selfish means self-love. You're not following uh, or what God wants you to follow, you're following yourself. You're doing what you believe is going to make you happy. But we must never forget that the pleasures of sin are but for a season. Some people have uh, 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 idols or uh, recreational pursuits. They always want to go fishing and sports. You know, basketball and uh, this football have become idols in this country. I recently uh, went to a funeral, and um, they had the deceased uh, buried in um, the Washington Redskins uh, suit. Now, I, I, I looked at that. I didn't say anything about it, but I said to myself, wow, this is, this is his final testimony. And so they sent him out dressed in Washington Redskins uh, memorabilia. And all the people in the funeral had uh, the Washington Redskins mask, and uh, they had uh, some of them had the Washington Redskins hat on. And I said to myself, is this what this man who is gone, is this what he is going to be remembered by? Nobody said anything about his soul, or he gave his life to Christ, or he served the Lord, he was faithful in serving the Lord. All they could say was that he loved the Washington Redskins. And I said, wow, what a testimony. And you know, when he stands before God, God is not interested in the Washington Redskins. God is not interested in, in, in how many games he went to. God is not inter- and he was betting on those games. But, and, and God is not interested in those things. God wants to know one thing. Did you receive salvation in the name of my son, Jesus Christ? That's all he's interested in. Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? And so people make these recreational pursuits uh, of God. And then let's talk about the mature possession. You know, people brag about uh, how much their house costs, how much their car is worth how much money they got in the bank. And and now the new trend is uh, people are talking about their 401Ks and their Roth IRAs and all of the assets that they have. But these same people are not concerned about their soul. And it reminds me of the story in the Bible where the man said, you know, he had all this money and he said, um, he was sitting up counting it one night, and he said, I'm going to tear down my barn and build bigger barns. So he was making more room for his money. 
But the uh, angel of the Lord spoke to him and said, Thou fool, tonight thy soul will be required of you. You see, most people have no idea when they're going to take their last breath. So we should be focused on something more important than earthly possession. Because first of all, you can't take it with you. I have never seen a U-Haul truck uh, following behind a hearse. They don't take your stuff to the grave. They take you to the grave. Also, you, 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 it is, it, it is of, even if you could take it with you, it is of no value, absolutely of no value in the kingdom of God. This stuff is corrupt, and it will corrupt and moth, and it will rust. And so we, we don't seem to understand uh, or put these things in priority. It's nice to have uh, some earthly possessions, but there are some things I, I really don't even want. There are some things I just don't want because they cause too much trouble. People kill you uh, behind certain things. But the bottom line is no matter what you own here in this earth, you will leave it here when you take your last breath. So the thing that we need to focus on is where we are going to spend eternity and not the accumulation of material possessions. And then some people uh, also uh, make idols out of power and prominence and prestige. You know, um, uh, uh, education is not a bad thing. I myself have an education. But I don't place no faith in my education. As a matter of fact, I am thankful that I was saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost before I ever went to college. Why? Because a lot of these colleges, these young kids go in these colleges who don't know Jesus, and they come out atheists. So I am so glad that God already had his hand on me. He already had gripped me. He had gripped my heart. So it, uh, 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 nothing that they could say in college could persuade me not to serve God. I know some of you saw the movie uh, God is not uh, God is not real. And, um, I mean, no, not God. God is not dead. Some of you saw that movie. Well, what it was about was this professor who he told his students on the first day of class. When you uh, come in class, write your name on a sheet of paper and say, God is dead. And and anybody who did that would get an A. And most of the students who professed to be Christians did what they said, what the man said, because they wanted an easy A. But there was one student that refused to write what he said because he knew that God was real. And he challenged this professor. I had to challenge a professor when I was in college. I was in a, a, a world religion class, and uh, it was a required course, and I was in this course, and this man tried to get me to say that all religions were the same, and I argued with him. I said, no other religion has a Savior who shed his blood on the cross, and the younger students who didn't really know the word they didn't have no word in them, so they kept saying, tell him, Miss Janet, tell him, Miss Janet. And I argued with this man for several days. He tried to say that communion of uh, 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 the blood and the wine, uh, that other religions had symbols that meant the same. I told him, no, no, no. I argued with him. I argued with him for about three days. And then finally, I went to the registrar's office. I told him I need to get out of this man's class because I knew I was going to get an F because I was never going to agree with him about those things. See, I knew too much. I, I had been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I was already saved when I got to college. I was already filled with the Holy Spirit, and I knew what God had done for me. So there was no way I could agree with this professor because he was wrong. He did not know the Lord, and I knew the Lord, so I couldn't listen to anything that he said. And uh, I wasn't going to go along. You know how they say, well, just go along to get along. No, I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to compromise with him. I was never going to uh, uh, 
agree with him. So we were never going to have common ground because I knew that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the only way to have salvation in Jesus' name. So I, I couldn't fall for that. So people use power and prominence and prestige to, uh, to, uh, 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 as idols today. And these are some common um, modern-day idols. Uh, as I said, acquiring possessions, gambling, money. Now, the Bible tells us about money. Uh, it says uh, in 1 Timothy 6 and 10, uh, I believe. Let me see. I have it here. 1 Timothy 6 and 10. It says, um, for the love of money. So let me read this scripture right here. Glory, hallelujah. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But that's 1 Timothy 6 and 10. I remember some years ago, I used to spend some time, I had some friends down in Atlanta, and I used to spend some time with them, and they told me about this organization where these people were giving out these uh, grants, large sums of money. Uh, They were going to finance all of these uh, business uh, proposals, and you had to turn your proposal in, and you had to, uh, you know, you just had to uh, go to all these meetings and everything. Well, at first they said you needed to attend four meetings. So I went to the four meetings, and then they said uh, you needed to turn in your business plan. I turned in my business plan, and uh, somebody else paid for me to uh, even get the membership to, to, to be in this thing. And um, in my heart, I began to suspect that something wasn't right with this. And um, I remember one time I went to Atlanta for one of these meetings, and uh, this was also a secret organization. They didn't want anyone to know. Now, it was Christian because they had all their services in a church, and, um, you know, they praised the Lord. And, you know, we, I, I heard some good preaching in uh, some of these meetings. But what struck me was that this was not on the web. They didn't want uh, people to know about it, and uh, so it was some secrecy. So that was the first red flag. And then um, they kept saying, uh, the money has been released. The money has been released. So everybody was waiting. And so they told us to kind of like fine-tune our um our business proposals and make sure that our budgets were correct and all of this, make sure that we had requested enough money to fund what we wanted funded. And uh, mine was for a school. I wanted to uh, open a a Christian school. But anyway, uh, I I felt like I had met all the requirements, so I knew I wasn't going to go to any more meetings. And um, I, I spent the night in Atlanta at some friends of mine's house. And that night while I was there asleep, as a matter of fact, I didn't sleep at all that night because the Holy Spirit convicted me with this scripture from 1 Timothy 6 and 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. God whoops me all night long with this scripture. And I got up the next day and um, canceled my membership. I I told them I'm not going to any more meetings. I didn't want anything to do with this organization. Now, I'm going to say this. God never said that the organization was false. He never said that the money was not real. He dealt with me concerning my heart concerning this thing. He, 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 used, he, he, he used the scripture to deal with me. I was convicted by the Holy Ghost, and I got out of it. I renounced it, and I repented before the Lord, and I left. I even broke fellowship with the people that had told me about it. 
Now, this is what I want to say. After all these years, the people still have not gotten any of the money. So there was some trickery involved because people still going to these meetings and they are still collecting offerings. But this money that was supposed to be in the World Bank, which had been released uh, at least, I want to say, 10 to 15 years ago, these people still have never gotten this money. You see how the enemy, he can lure you away. He can seduce you with money, power, and prestige. And it reminds me of the Pied Piper, how the Pied Piper played this music and lured all the children away from their homes. And um, he killed them. He killed these children. He drowned them. They drowned in the sea. This is what happens when we allow the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life to lure us away from God. Now, the Bible says in James, I want to read it for you because I always want to make sure that uh, I read things correctly. In James, this is what the scripture says. James chapter 1. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Let me uh, read this to you. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In James chapter 1. I know it's here. I'm just missing it. Somewhere. But anyway, I'm going to tell you what it says. It says, every man. Okay, here it is. James chapter 1. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So God does not tempt us, nor does he put things in our path to tempt us. Every man, when he is tempted, there's already something in him, and he is drawn away and tempted by it and drawn away by it. And that's what these idols do. They draw people away from God. Now, Apostle, he preached on uh, last night, he preached on the prosperity gospel, which is a false gospel. So many people were lured away from uh, the truth by listening to these false prosperity preachers. You see, anything that lures you away, it's got to have a hook to it. It's got to have the hook. You, it, It's got to find a place to hook into you. And it was lust, the lust for money, the lust for power, and the lust for prestige. So the love of money, the Bible never said that money what's the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. This is why people are gambling today. People are playing these scratch-offs and these one-armed bandits trying to acquire uh, instant success, instant overnight wealth. They want to uh, uh, get something for nothing. It's an idol. There are people that go and play these scratch-offs every day. They can't pay their bills. They never have money for gas or whatever their other uh, needs are, but they always manage to find a couple of dollars to go play these scratch-offs. That's an idol. All right? Shopping. Shopping uh, can be an idol. You have enough clothes. you You have more than enough, but you are continuously shopping. There's something There's something in you that's continuously causing you to want more. And everything that comes out, you've just got to have the latest this and the latest that. And it becomes an idol. 
Um, when I was a telemarketer, I worked for a company, and I learned that there are four categories that people spend money for. They buy for need, greed, fear, and exclusivity. I have never forgotten that. So people buy things that they need. People are motivated to buy out of fear because somebody will make an ad that says, well, what if this happens, all right? And and what if it's not real? And then people buy things um, out of uh, wanting to feel exclusive. So we got need, greed, fear, and exclusivity. People buy things because that's why people buy Bentleys. They don't need a Bentley. They just want to feel exclusive. Uh, uh, people are buying these jet uh, planes. A lot of pastors are buying these jet planes. They don't need it because they're not doing missions. They're not going to these uh, foreign countries to take uh, food supplies or to rescue people. They are using these airplanes for status. Nobody is flying on them but these pastors and their little entourage. They can get on a, 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 a public airplane, public transportation, but no, they won't do it because they want to feel exclusive. All right? Then we have uh, excessive exercise. That's vanity. When a person is always concerned about how they look, they're always looking in the mirror, they're always looking at their body, they're always trying to create this perfect physique. Uh, this body wasn't made to last. It's going back to the dust where it came from. And so that person has made physical exercise uh, of, of, of an idol. Now, exercise in and of itself is not an idol. As a matter of fact, it's rather healthy to have some sort of physical exercise. As a matter of fact, the older you get, you really need to exercise more so these joints and things won't get stiff. But when you spend all your time, I told you, anything that you spend more time with than God is an idol. So when you spend all your time uh, uh, working on your body, uh, trying to keep that physique or, or keep that shape, that has become an idol. Hobbies and sports are an idol. And, and uh, 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 Solomon said it best. He said it's all vanity. It's all vanity. Uh, um, uh, these fantasy and role-playing games and um, travel can be an idol. Music can be an idol. And pleasure can be an idol. Even eating food can become an idol. Sometimes people eat when they're not even hungry. These things can become idols in our lives. Glory be to God. And God would not have us to uh, bow down to these things and, and serve them. Now you say, well, um, Pastor, we don't, we don't bow down to idols today. Yes, we do not bow down to statues of wood and statues of stone today, but people are still serving idols. They are serving idols today. Now, the Bible tells us in Exodus, you shall have no other gods before me. This is one commandment that most of us, we don't even think we ever break that. We tend to uh, think that an idol worshiper is somebody that's laying prostrate before a carved image. But serving an uh, idol is much more broader than that. An idol is anything or anyone that takes the place of God in our lives. So if you look at your time, where you spend most of your time, TV can be an idol. Now, is television in and of itself uh, uh, sinful? I like to watch Westerns, but the Holy Spirit will tell me when to cut them off. You see, I, I have control over it. It doesn't control me. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So our God is most he he is most worthy he deserves all the praise and we we uh who have been born again we should be so thankful and so grateful that he had us on his mind 
when he hung on that cross, that we should allow nothing and no one to come between us and serving God. Now, so what are the idols in our lives today? One of the biggest idols in our life today is the idol of self. You see all this selfism and self-help and this pride and this gay pride, all of this, that is idolatry. It is the worship of self. And God never told us to worship ourselves. This is what Romans, oh, I just love it. This is what Romans chapter 1 says. I'm going to read Romans chapter 1 and um, verse 30, uh, 23. I'll start at 21. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So the the God of self or selfism is where we have gone from worshiping the creator to the creature. And there is so much of that going on today. All of the advertisement that we see today is promoting self. And now man has started to believe his own life. Man believes that he can be his own God, which is impossible because man did not create himself. It is impossible. It is impossible for man to be his own God. But yet, we see all this selfism, all this selfishness, all this pride. In other words, they have rejected the word of God and rejected God as being the eternal one, the the true and living God, and now man wants to be his own God. I remember there was a commercial out a few years back and it was these women on there. It was a women's commercial advertising a pill, and it said, who says that a woman has to have a monthly menstrual cycle? So all these women jumped on board with this pill because this pill was uh, reducing a woman's menstrual cycle down to once a year. God, the creator, made our bodies the way that he made them, and that is to have a monthly uh, menstrual cycle once a month. But somebody decided that a woman could take charge own body and take a pill and only have it uh, once a year. Women started dropping dead left and right because God did not make the body that way. He made the body to discharge uh, 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 the waste once a month. And so when they began to take this pill that would circumvent what God had said, it messed women's bodies up and they started dropping dead. They took that pill off the market so fast. You see, the Bible says, be not deceived. Take heed that no man deceives you. If you want to know how this body works, you must go to the creator. The creator. It's just like I I, I have this cell phone here. If I want to know how this cell phone works, I need to go to the manufacturer. It's no point in me going to someone else to ask them how to work this phone. The manufacturer 
all about it. He will tell me how to work it. So we have to follow God's instructions. He is the creator. The creature is absolutely nothing without the creator. Glory be to God. So we see that in Romans 1 and 25. We change the truth of God into a lie. This is idolatry. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator. So that is the idol of self. Now, let's look at, uh, oh, I want to talk about this for a minute. Uh, I remember when um, they started this thing with selfies. I knew that there was trouble right then because all of a sudden, people started posting these selfies of themselves. And to accommodate them, they even created a, uh, a selfie stick to put on the end of your cell phone so you can take a picture of yourself. And women began posting all of these pictures of themselves on various poses, and various outfits of themselves on the Internet. Well, let me tell you why that's such a dangerous thing. It is because uh, they have the technology today to take any picture that you post on that Internet, and they can take your head and put somebody else's body on it, or they can take your body and put somebody else's head on it, and they can have you doing some ungodly things that you did not do. So for you women that are listening to the sound of my voice, stop posting all of these pictures of yourself on the Internet. Stop it, especially your children and your family members. Stop posting all of that because uh, there are pedophiles out there. People are watching uh, uh, different sites. They're looking at your poses and they can do all sorts of things through the use of technology with your picture without your consent. And anything that you post on the Internet is public domain. So they don't even need your permission. They don't even need your permission. All right, this next item that I want to talk about is the God of pleasure. Now, the Bible tells us that the pleasure of sin is for a season. That's in Hebrews 11 and 25. For many of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. So the God of pleasure, people are bowing down to this God. Now, they're not bowing down like they did in biblical times to statues of wood and stone, but they are still bowing because they are succumbing. Let's look at pornography. Pornography is one of the highest, uh, and highest paid and fastest uh, 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 um, uh, organization uh, that's out there. And I mean they, uh, uh, the, the money that is spent in pornography, there is so much, it's on the rise. It's growing faster than anything else. Now, I want to talk about the tentacles of pornography. It lends itself to the uh, sex slave trade, and to the child sex slave trade. So pornography is like the, the big umbrella, and under it is the sex slave trade, and then the child trafficking slave trade. So people are engaging in things for pleasure, destructive things, drugs, alcohol, uh, this new fad, this uh, 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 um, this uh, uh, form of marijuana now, this CBD, all of this stuff. Uh, the people who worship this God are living for sensual and sexual pleasure. The problem with this is that once you have tried a thing, you soon tire of it 
and then you need more. And it becomes more perverse, more deviant, and uh, it produces an unholy appetite that cannot be satisfied. It's insatiable. So what God is saying is that we should not bow down to the God of pleasure. Glory be to God. We need to abstain from these things. Now, let's go to Acts, Acts chapter 15 and um, verse number 20. When the Gentiles um, became Christians, there was some concern about them. So we had this group that um, wanted to keep them, uh, the Pharisees, that wanted to keep them uh, in legalism, and they wanted them to be circumcised. So um, the Apostle Paul and uh, several others went up to Jerusalem for a council, and there they decided uh, what was needful for uh, the Gentiles for salvation. First was the blood of Jesus. They had become, they were believers, and um, uh, they had been baptized. So Paul said that there was no reason to put them under a yoke of bondage of, 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 of circumcision. So they decided, they said, I'm going to read for you. Wherefore, my senses is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So they stopped demanding uh, circumcision for them. They made a decision concerning them, and this was the final word. He said, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols. That was first, because the Gentiles were known for their idols. They were known for idol worshiping. So that was the first thing. In order for them to be Christians, they had to abstain from pollution of idols. And then he said, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. Those were the four conditions that they laid down for the Gentiles. Now, the, it, it is so amazing that the, at the top of the list was pollution from idols. Why? Because idols pollute the Christian life. If you have idols in your life, you have been contaminated by them. And we know that anything that pollutes contaminates. So Paul was saying that you cannot serve two masters. Either you will love the one and hate the other, or else you're going to be loyal to the one and despise the other. But you cannot serve God and mammon. So uh, uh, a man's life consists not in the abundance of things which he possesses. That's Luke 12 and 15. And then the gospel tells us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So let's look at Luke 12. I want to go there, um, verses 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And then he says in verse 20, <clears throat> But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall they be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So you can tell where a man's heart is because that's where his treasure is. Glory be to God. And the Bible says, lay not up treasures for yourself. In other words, we need to learn 
how to depend on God. The word of God tells us that my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches and glory. So when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he did not teach them to ask for things uh, in abundance so that they could have uh, much stored up. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Glory be to God. So we need to come back to what God has taught. All right? Now, he made no distinction between the Gentiles and the um, Hebrews. Made no distinction between them. The Gentiles were cleansed by faith. They were saved immediately the moment they believed in Jesus Christ, and it had nothing to do with any work. Salvation is by grace and faith alone. So the Gentiles, they gave these guidelines as a way to help them live holy unto God. And uh, they are the same guidelines we need to follow today. Glory be to God. You see, Christians are not bound uh, by the Mosaic dietary laws. Glory be to God. And so we don't have to follow them. These were requirements that uh, they decided should be fulfilled not to gain salvation, but to keep themselves from idols. Glory be to God. God does not want his people involved in idolatry. And if, if you look through, just read the Bible, idolatry was a major theme throughout the Bible. And why did God hate it so much is because it challenged his authority and his sovereignty. Idols are really nothing. They are dumb. They cannot speak. They cannot hear. They cannot talk. They cannot think. Uh, let's look at um, Kings, First Kings chapter uh, 18. Glory be to God. When the prophet went up on Mount Carmel, he, um, he told them that they had a contest up there. They had all the, uh, the, the prophets of Baal, and they had uh, Elijah, which was God's servant. So when they got up there, he gathered together um, the 450 prophets of Baal. And then he had the people of God there also. And his question was very simple. He said, how long will you halt between two opinions? Because the children of Israel, they seem to have forgotten who was the real or the true and living God. He said, if God be God, then follow him. And if Baal is God, then follow him. So he held a contest. But I noticed that the prophet Elijah, he let uh, the Baal worshipers go first. And I just love that because he let the devil go first. Now, they got up there, and they began to call on the God or their God, which was Baal. And um, the Bible says that they cried from morning until evening. And they began to say, oh, Baal, hear us. But the Bible says, but there was no voice, nor any that answered. And then they leaped on the altar. And it came uh, about the time of noon. Elijah started mocking them and having fun. He was making fun of them. And he said, cry louder. He said, for he is a God. That's with a small g. And he said, uh, maybe he's talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and somebody needs to wake him up. You see, uh, 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 the true and living God is, is, is never too busy. All of us, all of the believers in the entire world can call on him at the same time of day, and God will hear each and every one of us. He, he's a talking God. He hears. He listens. Glory be to God. We were made in his image and likeness. So we have mouths, and God has a mouth. We have ears, and God has ears to hear. We have eyes to see, and God has eyes to see. So we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about 
or whether an idol is anything. An idol is nothing. An idol is absolutely nothing. But we were made in God's image and likeness. These idols cannot talk. They cannot hear. They cannot speak. They can do nothing. As a matter of fact, most of them have to be carried from place to place and set up on something. So I don't understand why people are having trouble with these idols. But the idols of today, they don't look anything like the idols of the past. And people still are looking to idols. They're calling on idols. Some people call in the psychic hotline. Why are Christians calling the psychic hotline? These people have no power. They have no power. They don't know anything. They only know what you tell them. So we need to leave the, leave our uh, idolatry alone because for uh, idolatry, many Christians, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be honest with you, the children of Israel did not make it into the promised land because they got involved in idolatry, they walked in unbelief, and they murmured and complained against God. So we, we as believers today, we have no reason, but we still fall into the same trap. We can look at the children of Israel from back then and point our finger at them, but we still fall into the same trap today. You see, idolatry is a matter of the heart. It is associated with pride and self-centeredness and greed and gluttony, and the love for money and the love for, for possession. Idolatry has always been a major theme of the Bible. It attempts to offer man alternative way or explanation to the issues of life. It is not biblical. It is uh, uh, uh it displeases God. As a matter of fact, he says, I am jealous for you. And an idol is anything or anyone, it could be a person, that uh, takes the place of God and takes uh, your focus and, and, and your priority in life. So we need to stay away from idolatry. Now, when we look at Abraham, Abraham was called out of um um, uh, what was the name of that place? Out of Canaan. Let me see. I, I know I'm not saying that right. Oh, I'm going to say it in one second. Abraham was called out of. Yeah, out of Canaan, but Ur of Chaldees, that's what I wanted to say. All right, so when God called him out, he called him out of Haran, and he told him, um, I'm, I'm going to show you this place, and he said, you'll know it when you get there, and um, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, he was called out of an idolatrous land. They had they were they had a polytheistic uh, background. In other words, they served many gods. And um, some of the people, when they came out, they brought their gods with them. And um, but God was not pleased. You see, this brought judgment upon the children of Israel. And as I said, as soon as they came out of Egypt, the first thing they did was uh, build the golden calf, and, and they danced around it and worshipped it. And God was not pleased with this. And um, God forbids us from doing such things. He forbids us from even calling on uh, the names of these false gods. And idolatry, idolatry, God called it whoredom. Whenever the children of Israel got involved in idolatry, he called it whoredom because it was parallel to adultery. They were married to God, and yet they cheated on him. And that's what we find uh, in the story of Gomer and Hosea, where God told 
Hosea to marry this woman, and then she cheated on him, and God told him to go and buy her back because God was demonstrating his love for us, and he was showing that even though his children or his people had uh, committed spiritual adultery and whoredom on him, he still loved us, and he would still redeem us. To purchase, uh, to redeem means to purchase, and, and God was showing his love was greater than anything. So um, before I get ready to close tonight, I want to share um, some scriptures with you concerning idolatry. I want to give you lots of scriptures so that you will know that God does not condone idolatry. And the first one is right here. Hang on. Um, Let's look at, we looked at Exodus 20 and 3, which says, you shall have no other God for me. Exodus 20 and 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Psalm 135 verses 15 through 17. Now, I really, really, really like this particular scripture because it's talking about the idols of today. Now, it says, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. That's Psalm 135, verses 15 through 17. All right, here's another one. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. God said it it, is is nothing. It's nothing. That's Habakkuk 2 and 18. An idol is absolutely nothing. It's like a puppet. It's like uh, 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 these um, ventriloquists. They, they, they have a puppet, and um, they will make it, you know, make some movement, and then they throw their voice to make it seem like the puppet is talking, but the puppet is just is nothing. The puppet cannot talk. The puppet cannot hear. The puppet cannot speak. The puppet is only being moved by the ventriloquist, and the ventriloquist actually throws his voice to make it sound like the puppet is speaking. And this, again, goes back to the scripture in Matthew 24 and 4. Take heed that no man deceive you because What the ventriloquist does with the puppet is a form of deception to make you think this puppet can talk, but actually no puppet can talk. All right? Let's look at Isaiah 37 and 19. And have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. Leviticus 26 and 1, you shall not make idols for yourselves or erect an image or pillow, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. That's Leviticus 26 and 1. And uh, Hebrews 13 and 5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that uh, idol is the love of money. Jonah 2 and 8. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. So we talked about the ways 
that idols can sneak into our lives um, uh, through uh, selfism. And um, we talked about the idol of self and how we were designed as men and women of God to uh, glorify him. So that is the purpose of every believer. We were created to glorify him. Again, we talked about security, uh, how people rely on idols for security. Um, uh, They use it to be significant or to have security, and that's in their own strength apart from God. And we know that will never work because everything that we rely on apart from Christ is shaky, every single thing. It's only on Christ, the solid rock, we will stand. Glory be to God. Another uh, method of, of idolatry is seeking approval of others, wanting to belong, and um, wanting to be accepted. We must remember that we are accepted in the beloved. Glory be to God. The minute you and I received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the minute we accepted him by faith, we were accepted in the beloved because we were once aliens and enemies of the cross, and now we are accepted in the beloved. So we don't need the approval of man. Glory be to God. Relationships. um, We have to remember that only Jesus Christ can meet our deepest needs for love and to be loved. And that is a healthy love. That's a healthy relationship. No human being can fill the empty places in our lives. No human being. Only God, only God, he alone saturates, or as the Bible says, satiates the empty soul. Glory be to God. Success. Many people are enslaved today by the idol of success. And um, they will do a a whole lot to get to the top, to climb to the top. But our identity must be found in Christ alone. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So let me continue with some scripture uh, that you can look up tonight in your leisure. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 7, glory be to God. I'm not going to read these out. I'll let you look them up on your own. 1 Corinthians 10 and 14, 1 John 5 and 21, Colossians 3 and 5, Isaiah 45 and 20, Judges 10 and 14, Leviticus 19 and 4, Psalm 16 and 4, Galatians 4 and 8, Revelation 9 and 20, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Exodus 20, verse 3 through 6, Isaiah 44, verse 9 through 20. And I already gave you Um, Some other scriptures is um, tonight's teaching on the idols are coming down. Now, I told you about the idols, but I want to go back to the original scripture in Deuteronomy where God says that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water uh, under the earth. And you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And this is why we must not serve idols, because it is God who saved us by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross in our place. 
His blood was shed for the remission of our sins. He paid our sin debt. He paid the debt that we couldn't pay, but it was the debt that he did not owe. So he was the substitute for us on the cross. And therefore, he says, I am a jealous God. But he promises to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And then Matthew 22 says it this way, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And both of these passages, both of them, condemn idolatry. So God does not want his people involved in idolatry every time that the nation of Israel got involved into idolatry, they also went into captivity. And it's the same with us. Every time we get involved with idols and making idols of things and people, we go down into some form of captivity because it gives the enemy the legal right to come in and make us captive slaves. And we know that Satan, he, he doesn't play fair, but he cannot come. The Bible says the curse causeless shall not come. So it has to be a legal right for Satan to put you or uh, us in bondage. And God is always the one that had to come and deliver his people after they cried out to him, after they repented. But then what was so amazing was they would always go back, go right back to the idols and go right back into uh, captivity. One time they even complained against God saying, uh, we wish we were back in Egypt because we had the food, we had the onions and the leeks and all this stuff. They were in idolatry. And so God gave them the quail, and the Bible says while they were eating it, some of them burst open. So we have to be very careful when it comes to idols. So I just want to conclude with this. Examine yourself. Search yourself and see whatever you are spending most of your time on, whatever is getting your attention more than God, that's an idol. And I would encourage you tonight to repent and to offer that thing up to God, asking God's forgiveness, and then turn away from anything that's hindering you or keeping you from drawing closer to God. It is an idol, and the idols are coming down. Apostle, I know you're with yes. us tonight. Would you have yes, anything ma'am. you'd like to add to this? Wonderful teaching, scripture by scripture by scripture. People, God wants us to put him first. And Evangelist Taylor, throughout my years of being a Christian, and I've been doing this 14 years, I'm far from perfect. But I see this. I, I see uh, this lady called me the other day, and I was on conference with her and her husband. And I'm looking at the man and my, and the pastor and the pastor and the pa- I said, the Lord tell me she's idling. I said, you idling that man? What about your husband? I, I don't hear you say nothing about your husband. We got to stop idling pastors, especially non-anointed ones, performers. Amen. And yeah, Y- y'all getting caught up in the performance and uh, money coming unto me now and all this foolishness. Don't idol nobody but the Lord Jesus. It's an excellent sermon. And I see Christians are very rebellious. All I meet throughout 14 years of my life doing radio is I call them finger bangers over and over and over. For seven years, the Lord had me to call this guy. 
I'll call his name out, James Jones. Seven years to get him to recognize that he'd been deceived. Seven years. Wow. And then he, the Lord called me and told him to tell him to fast. I said, you you lying. You ain't fasted today. Uh, well, uh, I, I also, and, and people just do what they want to do. You're not going to get to heaven doing that. If you got eyes in your heart, you better listen to this message. Van said it was a very, very powerful a sermon. I enjoyed it. And we're going to let you let everybody know how to sow seeds. This sister, this ain't free. This sister labors. Uh, if we were sitting here teaching about how you can get a million dollars in, in five months, y'all be dropping money on us. But when a person is teaching like this, y'all don't like this. And this is what you need, scripture. You don't need nobody telling you money coming unto me. It's foolishness. It's foolishness. But our labor is not worthy of a high source seed and help this sister out. Sister Taylor, let everybody know how you can contact, and we're going to close with one of your songs, You Are God. Amen. Well, you can, if God leads you, you can sow a seed by PayPal or through Zelle using this email address, jet245 at msn.com. Make sure that you are being led by the Spirit. You can contact us on the web if you want to donate through the website, www.wallsoffiredeliverancemin.com. That's www.wallsoffiredeliverancemin.com. So those are three ways you can sow. Donate through the web or through PayPal or Zelle using the email address jet245 at msn.com. If you want to reach us by phone, call us at area code 336-830-0601. We will be happy to pray with you. God bless you, and remember that God hates idols, and the idols are coming down. <laughs>